It is my pleasure to have Don Trenner on. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you. Musical director to the stars. Let's just call it what it is. Um, you wrote a book called Leave It to Me, My Life in Music. There's so many stories I want to ask you about. Um, we're going to get right to it. So uh, you, as a kid, were in Hamden, raised in New Haven for part of that. You become a musical director, but how did you find your way into music first? And, and we can mention Anne Margaret and Bob Hope, but we'll get to that in a second. How did music find you? Before I was six years old, I reached up to a keyboard and started to play, and my mother recognized the possibility of my having some talent and they discovered that I had perfect pitch, which has been a help and also a hindrance. And, and a photographic I, memory? Oh yeah, absolutely, yeah. About uh, everything? Not, well, not everything, but particularly when my mother would sit there while I was practicing and she would lose her place, I would say I'm on the second page in the middle of the third staff of board measure. Oh my gosh, okay, mm -hmm. so you go to Hill House, yes. correct? Was near Yale. Yes. How did you start to get into big bands and music? Well, I was uh, hopefully going to be a classical pianist and do concerts, and I became very interested in, quote, the orchestra, and Glenn Miller was stationed at Yale. Say that one more time. Glenn Miller was stationed at Yale. Love that, so. And I got very familiar with that, and I met someone who said that if you write an arrangement, Glenn Miller style, I'll get them to rehearse it, and I thought, really? And then they came to my high school and played it. It was wow. one of the thrills of my life. And you were how old when this happened? 16. 17? 16, 17. Mm -hmm. I had a big orchestra when I was 16. And we should say that you had an orchestra and you made the band fronts because you're a tinkerer. That's Is right. that correct? <laughs> That's right. So how did you, Don Trenner, I'm gonna have an orchestra at 16. How does that happen? Well, I just became so interested in the, the harmonic form of Glenn Miller and other orchestras. They used to call those name bands. And they used to come to the arena in New Haven on Sundays in Schubert Theater. Sure. And I would go there every Sunday and hear these bands. It was just it just felt that's my home. You know? Right, you start going on the road at some point. Oh yeah. yeah. Let's let's do the chronological history of okay. you have your own band, the, you write an arrangement for Glenn Miller, they play it. Now what starts to happen at 18, 19, 20 years old? Well, that's kind of easy to answer. Uh, I uh, when I turned 17, I graduated from high school. I was not at my graduation services. My parents picked up my diploma because I got a summer job in South Carolina. When I came back, I took an entrance exam at Juilliard, was awarded a scholarship, and when it came time to go in and play the piano, I heard somebody else in there, and I, heard I didn't feel nearly as good, so I walked out. However, that day, somebody that was associated with the Glenn Miller Orchestra told me about an opportunity to go with an orchestra. So I started traveling with the Ted Fiorito Orchestra which was really wonderful. We traveled through the country. We were at the Golden Gate Theater in San Francisco. When I turned 18, I went around the corner and registered for the draft. And with that orchestra, we traveled up to Portland, Oregon, and Ted, the, the leader of the orchestra, said, I want you to meet someone. He took me over and introduced me to Dr. and Mrs. Severinsen. As in Doc Severinsen? And Doc, his son, would now join the orchestra, and I was the youngest person in the band until Doc joined. He's three months younger than I am. Who was with Johnny Carson, of course, That's all right. those years. That's right. When did Don Trenner start to find some fame? When did that start happening? Was that before the Steve Allen show? I, I really don't know how to answer that. You know, I don't well, look at on, it that Don. way. Come on, Don. Toot know. your own horn a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's hard for me. Um, how did Steve Allen find you? Because I, I would say you were, let's say, the Paul Schaefer to David Letterman. You were, you were the Steve Allen show, and right. you were the musical director. That's right. How did you find yourself on that show? It's funny too. Steve Allen Jr. When we get together, he said. Did my dad and you have as much fun as we have together? And I said, no, because he and I are just, well, we're wonderful together. What was he's that? he's got his dad's humor, you know. What was that like? You're on the Steve Allen Show. Well, I was in Las Vegas. I was playing for Lena Horn. And I got a, when they delivered telegrams, I got a telegram from Westinghouse Broadcasting Corporation saying you have just been selected the musical director of the new Steve Allen Show. 
Did you know who Steve Allen was by then? Oh, sure I did, yeah. Because I had already done his show, but it was a weekly show. Well, how scary was that? It was, it was pretty scary and pretty thrilling, you know, to know that I was going to have a band on five nights a week and, and, and enjoy the variety of opportunities. And that's how I met so many people. I mean, I met all the comics that I work with. We always had a comic that was doing an opening for us. You know, the opening act was a comic. So. Let's show a picture. We've got a picture here of, of you and Steve Allen. These are early on antics um, that they yeah. did on David Letterman and all this. Okay, so we're, we're looking at this picture right now. What, what are you doing with Steve Allen? <laughs> and what year was this? This is around 1964. Okay, what's happening right here? Now, he came home from a trip and somebody told him about, let's make the outside parking lot a little skating rink. So we went out and they took this picture. Everything we old is new again because lots of shows are doing what Steve Allen did. Yeah, I know. He was really the daddy of all that, you know? He really was. We've got another picture here, which, um, which is just amazing. Um, who drew this picture of you? Tony Bennett. So Tony Bennett. Give me some stories about Tony Bennett. Oh, there are many stories. The last thing I did with him was I got a call from his office and I was really frightened because I thought, if this is going to be international, my passport just expired. <laughs> so I went to Madrid and did two television specials with him, not seeing the music. They gave me a tape to listen to on the plane. And it was glorious, and I love Tony. He's an amazing man. What does he like to work with? Well, the joy that he possesses when he's working is just so infectious. It's wonderful, you know. And now he's, he's working with Lady Gaga. I know, isn't that amazing? Timeless. Now this this picture you brought too that we that we just have to show. Who <laughs> who is in this picture, Don? And well, do you want the story or the picture? I want this. Let's have the story and the picture. Okay. You, you took this picture. Yes, I did. Yeah. Who's in this picture? I was on a trip, one of the Christmas trips that I did with Bob Hope. I did either six or seven of them every Christmas. Jane Mansfield and Mickey Hagerty, before they were married, were on the trip. And we stopped at Wake Island to refuel, and she decided to go swimming in her Angora bikini. And I got a shot of it. You know? I guess you did, <laughs> right? All right, since we're walking down memory lane right now, let's show a video, and then we'll talk about it, about okay. what this is about. I love big band. Tell me so who I. that band is and tell Charlie me. Charlie Barnett. And you were the guy on the piano yes, with the I, dark hair yeah, and, and the and mustache. mustache. Tell yeah. me about this band. Oh, it was wonderful. It was a great orchestra. I had just finished working in San Francisco and he reorganized this new orchestra and he called me and asked me if I would join and I spent quite a bit of time with him, you know. Well, you are amazing. Let's look at some other pictures that we have and we're gonna just take another walk down memory lane. Who, who is in this picture? Okay. Who is that and, and where was oh, that? Oh, oh this, is, this is important music history here. Uh, in the corner here is Charlie Parker. Right. Bird, right? Next to him is Chet Baker, a very, very famous trumpet player who made many records and did a lot of romantic singing, a volatile human being, died from drug, drug abuse. It was terrible. And that's me at the piano. And the bass player, and that's Lawrence Marable, who was a drummer that was recommended by Bird, uh, Charlie Parker. And the bass player was just sitting in that night. That's not the bass player that was with us. So I don't remember his name. And what was this occasion? We played at the Tiffany Club in Los Angeles. On Tell me about the Tiffany Club. It was a jazz a place that brought in jazz. I, I worked there again two and a half months later with Stan Getz. 
Oh, wow. Yeah. Next picture. <laughs> All right, well, who is this, Don? This is Anne Margaret. Oh. Tell me about Anne Margaret. Uh, there's not enough nice things I can say about her. She's incredible. You were her musical director. Yes, and she and her husband are very, very dear to me, Roger Smith, who is in failing health now. But Anne Margaret is, uh, is precious, just incredible. She's hard, in a rehearsal studio. She's the hardest one to find because she's very inconspicuous, even though that's not her persona. What was she, was she demanding as oh, a, no. on you as a musical director? No, no, she was. Could you follow her pretty well? Well, we did a lot of work. We put the shows together in lots of rehearsals in a rehearsal studio. Weeks and weeks and weeks of that, you know, with choreographers and, and dancers and finally putting the show together. Now, I've interviewed her one time, and she is a sultry human being, that one. She's a, a Svenska, she's Swedish. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> give me some, and I know how much you love Sweden. Give me some stories about Anne Margaret. Well, she, she finally wrote a book, and there's some stories in the book so I can talk about it. She talks about her problem with liquor for a while, and she, you know, she got through that. And um, she's married to Roger Smith, who is an amazing man. Not well anymore, but he's probably the best husband producer anybody could ever have. Mm -hmm. And they had a company that was, a lot of companies say, oh, we're just like a family. We were like a family. It's amazing. If anyone ever got ill, Anne Margaret was the first one there. Did you ever pinch yourself that you're working with Anne Margaret and Bob Hope and all these? I didn't pinch myself, but I'm really grateful. <laughs> I'm grateful for the experiences, believe me. Oh, and the stories. My life experientially has been so full. Well, it's not over yet, so you have, you have <laughs> no. more to go. All right, next picture. <laughs> All right, we have Shirley MacLaine. What is it like to work with Shirley MacLaine, and what was this occasion? Let's see, where were we on this? I don't remember, but this is a drummer that I took with me. He's my very close friend, Tom Duckworth. And you're on the right. I'm on the right, uh, and that's Shirley, of course, in the center. Tell me about Shirley MacLaine. A fascinating lady. How? She's a plateau seeker. She's on her way to this plateau, and she gets almost there, and there's another plateau. She's amazing, truly amazing. Musically, what was different about her? Well, she's, uh, I met her originally when she was really young. She was a guest on a Bob Hope show, and I was playing the Bob Hope show. So I met her a long time before I started with her, so I knew her quite well. And oh, there's so many stories I could tell you about her. Well, oh my goodness. we've got some time. Give me one. Well, we went to Richmond, Virginia, which was one of her, and that's where she's from, in that area. And we went to a theater there, and we, uh, we performed some things with the dancers that I was able to take into my studio and pre-record, because choreographers don't like to see dancers holding a microphone. So it wasn't a ripoff. They were actually singing, but we enhanced them with professional singers. Ah. And we put it on what we call click tracks, which is synchronized so that the orchestra stays together. Anyhow, we got to the, the Richmond, and um, we were opening night. There must have been 23 or 24 sound failures. And she does not handle that at all. She's the first one to let the world know that it was not her fault. <laughs> somebody else's fault. So the next day I went out, took a walk, and I went to get some greeting cards to send home. And I came back, and she was standing with Bob Wells, who was one of the writers of the Christmas song. He was the producer of the show. And she said, Don, I want you to go over to the theater and pack up all the music. The dancers have got the costumes organized and get out of town. I said, are you serious? So I went over to the theater, and I had to wait for the musicians to come in because some of them took music home with them from the rehearsal the day before and to look at it, you know. And we left town and, you know, the old, old story, the show must go on, the show must go off. So you were a <laughs> fixer, too. You <laughs> yeah. fixed a lot of stuff. All right, next picture. All right, who do we have here? Oh, one of the geniuses. I don't use that term too often. Is that Dizzy? That's Dizzy Gillespie. Genius how? It's just musical genius. Musical genius. Funny story. Do you like funny stories? Absolutely. 
my guitarist was Herb Ellis on the Steve Allen Show, and Herb Ellis was the guitarist with the Oscar Peterson Trio, one of the greatest guitarists. My little, whole orchestra lived in Woodland Hills. I found houses for them, and we were really together, you know. Herb invited me out for Thanksgiving uh, uh, for dinner, and Dizzy was there. And I, he lived in Upton, which is almost to San Bernardino. So he said, would you do me a favor and would you take, would you drive Dizzy back to the, the Lighthouse, which is a famous jazz club in Redondo Beach, California? I said, sure, I'd be happy to. So we drove him back and he was sitting in the back of the car and he started to talk about his wife. And the term then, the hip term was, boy, she can really burn, which means cook, right? <laughs> <laughs> and he said, man, he said, my wife cooked some chitlins for me. And she cooked them, and she cooked them, and she cooked them. When she finished with them, they were chitterlings. <laughs> <laughs> what great oh, stories Oh, they're great, have. yeah. He's a remarkable man. All right, next, next picture, Steve Allen. All right, tell me about this. It was just one time on the show that you guys were sitting. Mm -hmm. yeah, we were now, was he a pianist piano as well? Yes, he was, yeah. How good was Self -taught. he? Self-taught. Very good, considering the fact that he didn't have any lessons. He wrote 5,720-some songs. How do you remember that? Well, I just remember because I had to write them down, because he would write on a napkin. He didn't know how to read music. So he would write the, the letter C and then the letter G up here, which would mean the C would be here and the G would be up there, and maybe the next. And I'd go to his house and I'd listen to it and I'd write it down. And I, at that point, we did it on Ozalib, onion skin. So I'd write all his songs out for him. Now, as you see all these late night talk shows in their bands, do you say to yourself, yeah, we did that. Yeah, we did that. They're copying that, they're copying that, because you really were the precursor, the Steve Allen show, and some of the things that you did as a band leader, right? Mm hmm What have you seen copied that you did in the 60s? Do you watch any late night TV lately? I didn't, um, not too much. Not You're such much. a humble guy, Don. That's that's your problem. <laughs> I can't help it. I'm oh, sorry about that. That's okay. <laughs> your mom your mom raised you right. Now this is Gina Lola Brigida. Oh what, my! What is the deal here? Les Brown and the Band of Renown. Remember that? Absolutely. That's Les Brown. So he's the guy that's with the cigarette. Me. Yeah. All right. You're on the left. Yeah. I Gina don't. Gina Lola Brigida. Yeah. Um, we did a Christmas trip and we were in Madrid and she was guest on the show. And so this was at a rehearsal. I don't remember this picture at all. Well, what? Look at the year. Yes, 1958. Okay, then I told you incorrectly. I guess I was with Steve in 54. We, we're not gonna correct you. Okay. Gina Lola Brigida, a beauty. Mm -hmm. Tell me about her. Well, I didn't spend a lot of time with her. I spent time at the piano working on the song that she was gonna sing and correcting it and helping her perform. And she answered or asked questions and I answered them. and. We got got it together and we did the show. Oh, come on. She's a stunner sitting over there oh. in the corner. <laughs> <laughs> yes, she is. Yeah. All, all right, next picture. All right, tell me about this. Oh, well, when I was on the road at 17 years old and I went out, I mentioned I was at the Golden Gate Theater for my 18th birthday. We played a date just after that called the Mondre Cafe in Oakland. And a friend of mine from New Haven that I got on the band, and I had a date with a couple of girls. However, I don't remember whose car we were in. I just remember that I was driving, and I was looking in the rearview mirror because the girl that he was with is the one I wanted to be with, and I married her. Is that Helen? That's Helen Carr. And you, and she was a singer. Yes, she is. And she only allowed you to go out if she could go with you. That was tough on a career, yes? Yeah, it was. You know what the reason was? It's so interesting. I, I've always, another thing I wanted to do in my life was be a psychologist, and which never happened because I didn't have any university time. There wasn't time I was drafted. So I made the world my university. You know? Well, and, uh, and all these stars, you probably held them along well, too. You know. One more picture. Yeah. Um, and Raquel Welch oh. is in the center. Yes, she is. Well, you are around some beauties. Okay, you're, you're standing right behind her. Who else is in that picture? Do you remember? This is my dear friend Leonard, <coughs> excuse me, Leonard Vetterholm. Okay. He's a producer, director for Swedish television. 
and he's an amazing man, and he was at my house just a few weeks ago with his lovely wife, Liberta. I see. And that's B.J. Ward, and that was... On the that, left. That's the love of my life. That's the love of your life. And she is now married to Gordon Hunt, who is Helen Hunt's father. Oh, I'll be darned. And we just finished a song. I wrote, uh, Gordon wrote a lyric, and I wrote a song called, um, I, it was his title, it's called Thanksgiving Time. And we're just getting it out now. She's going to get it to Barbara Streisand, hopefully. Yeah. You're 88, is that correct? Mm -hmm. So you're not stopping anytime soon. I don't, not, not unless for red light, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> so, so you spend your time still composing, mm -hmm. arranging, mm -hmm. writing. Tell mm -hmm. me about your days. Well, I have a big orchestra that plays every Monday night that I've, I sort of inherited. I've been with, with it for 15 years. It's called the Hartford Jazz Orchestra, and it's a marvelous orchestra. And I can say that because it's an orchestra that I inherited. The man, unfortunately, passed away. I met him just when he was becoming ill and, you know, deteriorating. And he asked me if I would take over the orchestra. And we play there every Monday night from 8 to 10 at a place called the Arch Street Tavern. It's right across from the convention center. And we were there last night, and the place was jammed. It was hopping, was it? Oh yeah, it's, it's a bit. Well, it's not a. It's not a combo. This is a 17-piece orchestra, and it's quite wonderful. And we have a girl that sings with us the first Monday of every month. Her name is Nicole Pasternak, and she's wonderful. Oh, we'll have to come see you. A life well lived. In this book, you have so many stories about your life. I'm so glad you put it in book form. Um, Tell me about Bob Hope, and mm -hmm. how long did you work with Bob Hope? Uh, either seven and a half or eight and a half years. What did you learn from him? I learned that he was a remarkable man and probably the most respected and renowned entertainer in the world. You don't have a bad word for anybody, do you? <laughs> no, I, I don't. I deal with positives. Negatives are making break out in a rash. When you look back on your life as a musical director and as a writer, what stands out? Because it's been a long time on the road mm -hmm. in many different clubs. What stands out? I guess the joy of whatever you've worked on or, and the people that you've worked with happens. When it happens, it's joyful. There's nothing more wonderful than hearing an arrangement that you've written and taking it into an orchestra and then performing it and really feeling like it was good, you know? Well, Don Trenner, thank you so much for coming on oh. and imparting some of your stories so that people will hear them. Yeah. And get the book, Leave It to Me, yeah. My Life in Music. You're very pretty, too. Well, thank you, Don. No, thank you. I get the look. <laughs>